express my uh, gratitude to uh, Professor Gabriel Said Reynold for making this opportunity available to me. This is not my first time in Notre Dame University. Actually, this is my third time. The last time was in 2009, and I should express my sorrow and grief over the untimely death of one of our greatest friends and scholars in Quranic studies, Nasr Ahmed Abu Zaid, who died in 2010. 2010 was really a tragic year for the Islamic world. We lost three uh, great scholars. Nasr Abu Zaid was one of them, and then we uh, lost Muhammad Arkhoun from Algiers and France, and then Muhammad Jabri from Morocco. All of these, you know, important scholars were working on the Quran very diligently, and Nasr Ahmed Abu Zaid perhaps was the, in the forefront of Quranic studies. Gabriel has uh, actually put a very uh, big task on me. He has uh, suggested to talk about the Quran and uh, philosophy and the three very lofty, heavy topics and subjects on my tiny shoulders, and I'm not sure how I can, you know, bear the burden of doing the job, but I try. <coughs> well, um, it's a great challenge actually to think about the relationship between Quran and philosophy and law. And uh, I tried, you know, to somehow meet it. Um, first of all, I mean, I have to make some uh, clarifications because the Quran is very well known, but maybe we have got different perceptions and conceptions of philosophy and law. Law also is a little bit better known, but philosophy is really a very vague and ambiguous term because uh, although in the past, you know, it was fairly clear what we mean or people meant by philosophy. It was Greek philosophy, it was Aristotelian or Platonic philosophy, everybody knew it and learned it. And as you hear here, for example, Thomas Aquinas was the greatest philosopher in the Christian world and he was more or less similar to Ibn Sina in the uh, Islamic world. So by philosophy they meant metaphysical philosophy as we call it today. But as we are living nowadays, there are many ramifications, many branches in philosophy, philosophy of uh, language, philosophy of religion, philosophy of science, philosophy of ethics, continental philosophy, analytical philosophy, and so on and so forth. And uh, so when you uh, ask or you think about the relationship between the Quran and philosophy, which type of philosophy, which branch of philosophy you might mean. So this is the first thing that one has to have in mind. And uh, it goes actually for the law as well, because the idea of law, as I will come to that, was a little bit uh, different, at least in the Muslim world, from what it is now. You know, I mentioned Muhammad Jabiri just now. According to him, the civilization of Islam is civilization of law rather than civilization of philosophy. I think he's right in his categorization, his classification. He thinks and he says, and he argues actually for the idea that the Greek philosophy was the philo Greek civilization was the civilization of philosophy, modern civilization, the Western civilization of science and technology. But the civilization, Islamic civilization, is civilization of law rather than philosophy. We had great philosophers, but I think Jabari was right that uh, the jurists, the lawyers, had the upper hand in the uh, Islamic uh, tradition, in the Islamic civilizations. The numbers of books written on law, Islamic law, Sharia, far more exceeds the number of books written on philosophy and theology. Actually, philosophers were not free enough to express themselves, you know. They were at the mercy of jurists. And if jurists actually did not like them, they could issue a fatwa in order to terminate, you know, their life. So um, it was uh, somehow at the mercy of the Jews that they could leave, and we have got you know many many stories about philosophers and theologians who actually managed to live in such a way not to uh, you know hurt or not to offend any any Jews. So anyway, 
Philosophy is uh, something that uh, one has to decide before discussing which branch of philosophy. Here mainly I mean um, metaphysical philosophy and if you like epistemology. So these two are the most relevant branches and parts of philosophy which we can discuss and we can you know, somehow look for the relationship between the Quranic teachings and, uh, and, uh, and philosophy. <coughs> Um, of course, I mean, uh, it goes without saying that none of the um, vocabulary or terminology of the philo Muslim philosophers can be found in the Quran. None of them, actually. I mean, the, the words and the terms which uh, borrowed were borrowed from, from Greece, you know, from the Greek philosophy, like tab, I mean, nature, like even the word wujud, existence, you cannot find it in the Quran. Wujud or the existence is perhaps the most important and the most frequent word to be used by a philosopher, a philosopher working on metaphysical philosophy, a philosopher working under the influence of Aristotle, the Plato, and so on. But the word wujud in the sense of being or existence cannot be found in the Quran. Perhaps, uh, of course, you have vajada, but that means not existence, means to find. And that is a different meaning for the wujud in the Quran. So you, you, you should not you know, look for such terminology in the Quran, and it is very obvious why not. You might say that the Prophet of Islam did not know philosophy, he was not a philosopher, that might be an explanation, or you might say that the God of the Prophet Muhammad did not like to uh, you know, address philosophers, did not like to teach or preach philosophy to people. You know, the job of the prophet was different. You know, he was a prophet, not a philosopher, not a historian, and so on and so forth. Whatever the explanation, philosophy as such is not to be found in the Quran. I mean the vocabulary of philosophers which later on were introduced into the Muslim tradition, Muslim culture. Nor Quran can be, you know, uh, considered as a book on philosophy in the sense that it is not an argumentative book. This is the tradition of all religions. I mean, prophets were no philosophers. Therefore, they did not speak philosophy. They did not use philosophical methods. I mean, let alone philosophical terminology in order to preach and to convey their message. Uh, <coughs> uh, analogy is perhaps the best way, the best method that prophets did use in order to, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, to convey their message to the, to the people. Therefore, <coughs> like in the Gospels, in the Quran, you will find, you know, many, many stories, fables, and, uh, you know, myths and analogies to, uh, to express the, the idea of uh, that Muhammad, the prophet, had in mind, or perhaps his God wanted to, uh, <coughs> for the people to understand. When I was, you know, looking in the Quran for the, I don't know, I mean, maybe hundreds time, in order to see how philosophy has been used by, by prophet or can be found in, in the Quran, you know, the main idea of the Quran, perhaps, of the Islamic teaching is Tawheed, is the unity of God. So, perhaps a Muslim or a non-Muslim expect the Quran to offer some arguments, some demonstrations in favor of the unity of God, in favor of the existence of God. But that cannot be found in the Quran at all. You know, it's all <coughs> like I am telling you. This is the way that the Prophet, you know, talks to the people. I have seen the truth and I am now telling you about the truth. You should not ask me about any argument, any definition, anything like that. This is the truth and you can open your eyes in order to see. That is the way you find it in the Quran. There is only one single argument in the Quran about the unity of God. And that is this. Unfortunately, I did not have time to uh, prepare, you know, perhaps a PowerPoint in order to make these points more explicit to you. But, you know, I'm sure that there are esteemed scholars among us and students who, who know Arabic and who know everything. So by reading the verses of the Quran, you can guess what is the meaning, and I will help you in order to <coughs> to better understand it and uh, and to then to interpret it. You know the the verse that uh, 
is seemingly an argument, a demonstration in the favor of the, of the unity of God is this. If there were two gods, or if there were more than one god, then the whole universe would collapse, or disintegrate, or corrupt, something. So this is the main argument in the Quran. It is very, I mean, seemingly philosophical. And the story is very fascinating, <clears throat> because when you go back to the interpretation and explanation of this argument, in the commentaries of, uh, of the past, you know, uh, commentators of the Quran and Mufassiri, you will find some very interesting, you know, explanations. The ancient explanation for the, for the verse, that why, you know, if there were more than one God, you know, the whole universe will collapse, will disintegrate. Why is that? They would offer you this, that if there were more than one God, then they would you know, sometime come into conflict, you know. One of the gods would say, let the rain fall. And another god would say, let not the rain fall. And let Newton be. And the other, you know, uh, god might say, let not Newton be. And over the conflict, you know, the whole universe will collapse. And nothing will go on. Nothing will progress. So that was the explanation of the verse that if there are more than gods, the whole universe, you know, will be in ruin. But later on, and uh, being more philosophically mature, you know, Fasserun, the commentators, came to a better explanation of the verse. And that is, of course, very philosophical. It is based on Aristotelian philosophy. It is based on Avicenna philosophy and um, Shiraz's philosophy. Here, actually, you have got a very full explanation, philosophical. Nobody is sure that it was in the mind of the Prophet Muhammad or God, but, of course, it is a good explanation. It says that, uh, <coughs> according to, uh, to uh, peripatetic philosophy, the effect actually owes everything of him to the cause. So there can be no, I mean, a plurality of causes over one single effect. So one single effect owes everything to the single cause. So having two causes for the single effect means that either one of them is redundant or the second one will annihilate the effect rather than to reproduce it again. Because reproduction, reproducing the same thing that has been produced beforehand is, is impossible. So uh, this is actually one of the uh, main arguments to be found in the Quran, and this exception tells you about the rule, actually. The rule is that you should not, you know, go and look for any argument, any demonstration in, in the Quran. <coughs> the same goes for the idea of the resurrection. The resurrection is uh, one of the three pillars of the Islamic, you know, uh, faith. You have got the unity of God and then the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad and then the resurrection of bodies, the bodily resurrection in the day after. There is virtually no argument in favor of that. There are, of course, polemical arguments. People came to the Prophet and asked him, you know, according to the commentators, can God resurrect his rotten uh, uh, bone? And the answer is this, yes. The one who has created it in the first place can do it again and again and again. So that is the polemic against the person. But there is no argument in favor of, of in order to prove that there should be of necessity, and this is the philosophical proof, a, a resurrection of all bodies in order to receive either punishment or reward and so on and so forth. One of the important and beautiful analogies about the uh, about the resurrection of bodies is a spring and, uh, you know, and rain. You know, this, there are a number of places in the Quran that tells you, look at the falling of rain, look at the spring, where the earth is virtually revived, you know, by falling rain. So the same would happen in the resurrection time. That is only the analogy that you find in the Quran in order to tell you make it plausible and intelligible to you how uh, the resurrection can be possible. Only the possibility and conceivability is perhaps produced and introduced, but not a proof in order to tell you that necessarily such an event can happen and will happen in future. Now, uh, <clears throat> Let me go on a little bit uh, and uh, tell you more about the, um, 
the uh, non-philosophical nature of, of the Quran and uh, uh, how it, you know, um, tries to uh, to put forward the the ideas and the arguments that uh, is relevant to the prophethood of the prophet. Let us uh, take into account the words uh, which uh, um, is somehow relevant or pertinent to epistemology nowadays. Words like demonstration, burhan, or jadal, which means disputation, or uh, let us say polemics, reason, apple in the Quran, fu'ad, which means heart, and so on and so forth. One thing is important. There is no mention of brain in the Quran. All you have is either heart, qalb, or perhaps uh, reason, apple, and fu'ad, which again uh, means heart, and so on and so forth. There has been a dispute among Muslim theologians and philosophers. What is the organ for understanding and perceiving? Is it heart or brain? Uh, strangely enough, that one of the uh, Muslim mystics, Rumi, whom I'm sure you know very well, he is on the side of brain, you know. Mainly he, he mentions that the brain is the main organ for understanding. But most of the commentators, most of philosophers and theologians actually go for the heart. And they think it has got a very long tradition in all, you know, uh, the past cultures, that the heart is the place and the citadel of understanding, of knowledge and everything. And in the Quran, of course, you have got the same word, qalb, which uh, tells you, you know, very strongly that brain perhaps is, is, uh, is irrelevant to the uh, understanding and perceiving and grasping knowledge. So you have got such words in the Quran, but again, of course, one is not to conflict the meaning of this word with what we understand from them nowadays. For example, I mean, uh, Muhammad Jawiri argues, I think, very positively and, uh, you know, quite persuasively that the word aql in the Quran, reason, does not mean Greek intellect. It means mainly practical reason rather than theoretical reason, you know. Most of the time that you find the word apple in the Quran, it means that uh, you have to obey your God. You have to distinguish between the bad and good, and so on and so forth. <coughs> Even the word hikmah, wisdom, you find it several times in the Quran. And sometimes it has been translated into philosophy or some of the translators. But it is a wrong translation. Hikmah never means philosophy in the modern sense, nor even in the classical sense of the word, because hikmah is uh, one of the attributes of God. God is a hakim, somebody who is wise, who, who have wisdom. Never we can call God a philosopher, but we can call him a hakim, and hakim, like uh, what you have it in, uh, in Hebrew, chacham or chokhmah, the same word which means, you know, having wisdom. Therefore, uh, there is a, a very famous verse in the Quran, Man Whoever has, uh, you know, received hikmah, he has received a great bounty. Now, the hikmah is a great bounty, but philosophy is not necessarily hikmah that is mentioned in the Quran, although, as I said, I mean, some people have tended to, to translate hikmah into philosophy and to persuade people that perhaps Quran is supportive of learning, you know, traditional philosophy. Now, there is an interesting word in the Quran that is Burhan. Burhan is usually translated into demonstration. And uh, one of the books uh, of, uh, of Ibn Sina, you know, in, in logic is Kitab al-Burhan. And there actually he is, uh, you know, I think best, better than any Muslim philosopher has, uh, you know, mentioned, explained, you know, the conditions and the requirements of a real philosophical demonstration that the premises should be universal, eternal, necessary, and so on and so forth. And uh, by the way, when I was teaching this uh, book to my students in Tehran Philosophy uh, University, I found that, uh, you know, Ibn Sina is even more elaborate on istagra, on induction rather than deduction, which is more timely, more relevant to human sciences nowadays. But anyway, his book on Burhan is one of the best. Now, the word Burhan, you find it in the Quran, but uh, one, you know, very hardly can say that the Burhan in the Quran means demonstration according to 
to logic, according to Aristotelian philosophy, it means just to show that you are true, that what you say is true, but how to show it, how to prove it, how to demonstrate it is a different thing, and you cannot find it in the Quran. There are several times in the Quran, in several verses, that uh, Prophet asks the, the kuffar, the, the non-believers, how to burhanakum, bring, show, offer your demonstrations, your proofs, but then does not say what are the proofs and what is the condition for proving something. Is it a logical proof, a logical demonstration, or perhaps just, you know, a common demonstration, bringing and offering some evidence, you know, mainly inductive evidence rather than a demonstrative deduction which is based on a syllogism with premises, necessary, eternal, general, and so on and so forth. That is not the case necessarily. And I haven't seen any of the Qur'an commentators who has said that the Qur'an in the Qur'an is exactly what it means in, in philosophy. But uh, this is important that uh, Muslim philosophers have used the word Qur'an for the logical demonstrations. Jadal is another word in the Qur'an which means polemics. And, uh, but again, the word Jadal, you find it in, in Muslim logic, and that's for disputation and for, uh, you know, uh, uh, for uh, <coughs> somehow reacting to the uh, polemics of your uh, enemy. But in the Quran, it mainly means that, uh, you know, uh, one who argues, who quarrels. The, the, the verse in the Quran, وَكَانَ الْإِنسَانُ أَكْثَرَ شَيْءٍ جَدَلًا Man is very quarreling, and this is in a negative sense, you know. Man is not an obeying, obedient to truth, would like to quarrel in order to make things, you know, vaguer and more ambiguous and not acceptable to himself. He's not following the reason, he's not following the demonstration, rather he's following his wishes and whims and so on. There is another verse in the Quran that says when you argue with the non-believers, just do in the best way, do it in the best way, quarrel or argue with them in the best way. So this is as much as it goes in the Quran, the terminology that uh, might be relevant, might be uh, considered as relevant to, to philosophy. And... Uh, uh, that's why, actually, a, a great, a prominent scholar like Al-Ghazali, who is the arch enemy of philosophy, who thinks that philosophy is not only not knowledge, but it is pure ignorance. And that's why he recommends people not to learn philosophy, because it is detrimental, it is deleterious, it is, it is an enemy of faith. But nevertheless, he thinks that the logic from among all philosophy is a good thing. And he writes himself a book on logic. Of course, he borrows the terms from the Quran. He doesn't like to use Aristotelian terminology. But he thinks that from among all branches, all divisions of philosophy, logic itself alone is, is something uh, valuable and usable by a Muslim and can, you know, uh, come to the help of, of, of Islamic faith. But the rest of philosophy, I mean, their arguments in favor of the existence of God, their arguments in, uh, about miracles, their arguments about many other things, according to him, are pure nonsense. And we better not to waste our time to, to learn, uh, you know, philosophy. That's why, actually, they thought that, uh, I mean, people like Al-Ghazali, that philosophy is inimical to faith, and definitely you cannot find it in the Qur'an. Coming to laws of philosophy, here also uh, we have got a number of things to, uh, to uh, think about. Um, <clears throat> when I'm saying that philosophy cannot be found in the Qur'an, it does not mean that it is not based on a philosophy, it is not based on a worldview, a Weltanschauung. These two are very different from each other. Qur'an is not a book on logic, but it is logical in the sense that uh, apparently you cannot find any fault in it. The author of the Qur'an has been 
has been alert to contradiction, or at least has claimed that uh, if the Quran were sent down by somebody other than God, you would find many inconsistencies in the Quran. So he has been very alert to contradictions, to inconsistencies, and uh, has been, you know, uh, perhaps has tried in order to, uh, to, to be absolutely consistent. So, uh, Quran is not a book of logic, but perhaps it is logical. It is based on some logic. It has avoided cons- inconsistency and contradiction. The same goes for philosophy. It is not a book of philosophy. It is not a book for philosophers. It is not a book based on definitions and proofs and demonstrations and so on and so forth. That is not the case. You wouldn't find any definition for any term which is used in the Quran. But it can be shown, it can be shown that it is based on some philosophy, some, you know, worldview. One of the uh, important things that has been a subject of many disputes among Muslim philosophers and theologians has been the law of causality. Now, does one, I mean, can one find, you know, that uh, Quran believes in causality? Are there causes and effects in nature? This is a philosophical position. Rumi, whom I mentioned here, and I should mention him again, he says that from the beginning, of the Quran to the end. The whole Quran teaches you to refuse, to reject, and to deny causality. Let me write, read you the Persian poem for those who understand Persian. Hamchenin zaghaz Quran ta tamam rafz asbab astuillat basal. From the beginning to the end, Quran is a book of rejection of causality. Why he says that? Because he is apparently, I mean, ostensibly an Ashariite. Because he believes in miracles, and he thinks that miracles are anti-causality, and they are violations of causality. Because he's a mystic, and he thinks that there is no real cause in nature. The real cause of events are God himself. So therefore, there is a direct causal relationship between the supernatural and the natural. There is no causality among the, uh, among the natural phenomena. This is according to him. And as you know, I mean, there are so many people who think the same. So Quran does not contain the law of causality. Actually, seldom, very rarely, you can find in the Quran that God or Muhammad, whoever you think, says that this phenomenon happened because of the other phenomenon. There is no such thing, or very, very seldom you find such a thing. I'm sure that there are scholars of Quran here and they can show me if there is any. There is a direct vertical causality between the supernatural and the natural. And that was absolutely the the vision of the Prophet Muhammad. That was his vision, that he saw in his vision that everything is absolutely dependent on God. Everything is directly and absolutely dependent on God. There is one and the one, only one, sole agent. Even uh, Rumi, for example, he, he doesn't actually, he, he avoids uh, calling God a cause. He calls him an agent, because according to him, and according to many others who think like him, an agent means a free agent, whereas a cause means a necessary cause, a cause which, uh, you know, has got no free will is determined, you know, absolutely determined, and necessarily does something out of its nature. Whereas an agent has got free will and so on, and there has been a long, long dispute among theologians whether God is a cause or is a necessary cause, but what is the free will, you know, uh, with respect to God and so on and so forth. But for Rumi, God is an agent, is not like a human agent, he has got free will, he is no cause, and there is no causality among natural phenomena, and the Quran teaches you the lesson of no causality, of you know, rejecting uh, causality. causality. <coughs> this is, but there are, you know, um, commentators and theologians. One of them, the recent, you know, uh, scholar in, in Iran, Tabo Tabai, who has written a 20-volume commentary on the Qur'an, Al-Mizan, 
fit of Sira Quran. He is adamant, insistent that the causality can be found in the Quran. Actually, the whole teaching of Quran is based on the law of causality, Aristotelian causality, if you like. And there is a necessary relationship between natural phenomena, a necessary. You see, Ash'arites, like Rumi and many others, they were really very human, or we might say Hume was very Ash'arite, if you like, <laughs> because he came after them. You know, they were very human in the sense, of course, different from Hume, because Hume, for Hume, cause was nonsense. It, it did not have any meaning. And many other words, like essence, for example, like quiddity and so on. But for Muslim philosophers, they were not nonsense, but they were non-existent. So there is a difference of position here. But they were very human in the sense that there is no natural necessity among the natural phenomena at all. Everything is, I mean, uh, independently and directly related to God and, uh, you know, takes and receives his or her or its existence uh, from God and he supports everything directly. And as I said, that was the vision of the Prophet and that actually created the idea of free will. Since the Prophet Muhammad actually saw everything directly dependent on God, that's why he said, and it is clear in the Quran, that the guidance is dependent on God. Going astray is dependent on God. Hidayah and Zalala, whether you are a good person or you are a bad person, everything is dependent on God, like every natural phenomenon. There is no mention of you know, natural necessity or natural causal relationship among phenomena. I remember only one place in the Quran in which you have this uh, kind of natural relationship between two phenomena. And that's in the Surah Al-Baqarah. And that's where actually uh, the Quran in the verse mentions the, uh, the, the, the issue of, uh, of magic, actually. There you find something. That the magicians in the time of the Solomon وَاتَّبَعُوا مَا تَتْرُوا الشَّيَاطِينُ عَلَىٰ أَحْدِ السُلَيْمَانِ وَمَا كَفَرَ السُلَيْمَانِ وَلَاكِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ كَفَرُوا And then it comes uh, <coughs> that uh, through the magic يُفَرِّقُونَ بِهِ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَزَوْجِهِ Through their magic they separated man and wife. That was the magic, that was the cause or reason of the separation of man and wife. This is one of the rare, very rare, you know, cases of a kind of causality. And strangely enough, it is in the context of magic. But no wonder, anyway, magic also is, uh, is, is, is a type of causality anyway, although it is not, uh, you know, uh, scientifically acceptable nowadays. <coughs> okay, the idea of... Uh, Ruh, or perhaps soul and psyche, that also is part of metaphysical philosophy. But um, you cannot find it in the Quran. In the sense that uh, you know, philosophers used it and mentioned it uh, later. Nafs is of course something which is, uh, Ruh has been mentioned two or three times, no, not more than that. And sometimes of course it is about Ruh al-Qudus, which is the Holy uh, Spirit. Um, of course, I mean, there is a mistranslation here, I would like to mention it to the scholars here. Ruh al in the Quran means the spirit of holiness, whereas it is usually translated as the Holy Spirit. Maybe the two translations are not very different from each other, but one has to be very careful. Ruh al means the spirit of holiness. If it is the, uh, the Holy Spirit, it should be ar-ruh al -qudus. I mean, the attribute, you know, the adjective of the ruh, but that is not the case in the Quran. Everywhere you find it, ruh al -qudus. But anyway, that is one case in which several times you have got the word ruh, which means soul, soul or spirit. But nafs, which means psyche and soul again, it has been uh, mentioned several times in the Quran. But uh, strangely enough, it is very different from the usage of the philosophers because in the Quran, nafs has been also used for the God Himself, for Allah Himself. Kataba Allah nafs rahmah Therefore, nafs means self. It doesn't necessarily mean ruh. And that's why we have got 
theologians and philosophers who have denied the existence of soul. I mean, among the Mutasilat, there are a group who think that the uh, man does not have any soul, does not have any spirit, and when he dies in this world, then he dies, and he will be resurrected, you know, years and centuries later, without his soul being there, you know, after his death. So he is absolutely dead. And at least you cannot find any Quranic support for the idea of nafs, for the idea of, uh, you know, uh, soul in the Quran, and uh, try, especially the spirituality or the immateriality of the soul that has been uh, a matter of dispute among Muslim philosophers cannot be found in the Quran at all. And uh, uh, things uh, there is much more, uh, you know, uh, ambiguous. <coughs> Okay, um, since uh, I am going to, um, to say something about law, and I'm not sure uh, if I have uh, passed my time, oh, a little bit. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, let me uh, just say a little bit about law and finish, uh, because we have got guests here from the law school, and they are uh, expecting me to offer something on law as well. Otherwise, my talk will be illegal and <laughs> lawful. <laughs> so let us make it lawful. Uh, my short answer to the first question, Quran, law, and philosophy, was that Quran is not a book of law, it's not a book of philosophy. That is, I elaborated a little bit on, on the philosophy, that why Quran, although it may have a philosophy, it may be based on a philosophy and uh, a Weltan Schaung uh, uh, worldview, but it is not a book of philosophy, it is not a book for philosophers, and it does not contain official formal philosophy, it doesn't contain any definitions, any demonstrations, mainly analogical you know, explanations and so on and so forth. And most of the terminology that uh, later philosophers have uh, used are not borrowed from the Qur'an, cannot be found in the Qur'an, and uh, there have been, you know, Muslim philosophers who have been absolutely anti-philosophy. There is a, a very important book written in 7th century A.H. by a mystic called Sohrabardi, Kashf al fazahir al exposing the uh, Greek scandals. And there actually he mentions, you know, these Greek scandals, Greek errors and, uh, you know, blunders, that blunders that, uh, you know, can be found among the Muslim philosophers. Now, what about the law? Um, well, uh, of course, it is, uh, you know, well known that uh, out of 6,000 verses of the Quran, only 500 are about the law, the legal matters. And the rest are either about the resurrection, about ethics, moral issues, and so on and so forth. So there are books written about the uh, legal uh, you know, issues in the Quran. And, uh, but I would tell you that, uh, especially among the Shia sect from which I come, the Jews never used the Quran for legal arguments, for, uh, as a legal source at all. You know, and there are jurists who say, and very explicitly, that even if the Quran is absolutely wiped out, annihilated, it would not harm the law, Sharia, the science of fiqh at all, because they mostly take, you know, their, uh, as, as a source of uh, their uh, uh, discipline, you know, the hadith coming either from prophet or from the imams in the case of Shia, and the hadith is so rich that virtually they are in no need to go to Qur'an and to find, uh, you know, and to discuss the, uh, the, the verses in the Qur'an. And strangely enough, I, I would tell you, and this is my personal experience, of a, you know, Jews, especially in Iran, they are not very well versed in the Qur'an. They do not discuss it, they do not uh, memorize it, they do not use it in their uh, juridical arguments, and that is the case usually. And then if you ask them some legal question, they would go you know, directly to the book of Hadith and tell you this is the case because of that Hadith or because of this and that. Never they show you any argument based on, on the Quran. So 
This is why, I mean, Quran is, has not been taken as a, as a source of law among Muslims, at least among Shi'is. I mean, uh, important. The second thing is, uh, you know, I would like to mention that even if it is a book of law, or there are some legal things in the Quran which there exist, as I said, at least 500 verses, but it is not law in the modern sense of the word, you know, because law in the modern sense of, sense of the word is based on rights rather than duties. Whereas the language of Quran is a language of duties, language of obligations. This is very important. Not only um, uh, Quran is like that, even you know the Old Testament. The language of all religions are the language of uh, obligations. It is a modern language that uh, you know we use, and uh, it is imbued with the idea of rights rather than obligations. So, if you think that you can translate the uh, the, the language of obligations into language of rights, it's a very big task. I don't think that you would succeed in doing that. And uh, the second thing is important in this respect. <coughs> is that uh, I, only one or two uh, cases I, I have seen in the Quran that speaks about the rights. If somebody has killed one of your relatives, your son, your father, you have got the right to kill the killer, the murderer. Here you have got the idea of rights, and this is the sole place and the sole case that you have the idea of rights. There is, of course, I mean, there is a much more important uh, case, but that is philosophical, that is not legal, and I do not, uh, you know, uh, mention that here. So, even if uh, you take Quran as a book which contains some law, but then you have to be careful. There is no definition of anything. So, I mean, then it, for example, mentions the idea of murder, but it doesn't define. What is that? What is you know uh, meant by by murdering somebody? When it uh, you know uh, mentions the issue of witnessing, you know shahada, it doesn't define. Whereas in a book of law, you have to be absolutely careful about your definitions, about the laws, about the exceptions, about this and that. So the language of Quran is not a technical language. This is something which I do you know, cordially believe in it. It is not a technical language, it's not a language of law, it's not a language of philosophy, it's an ordinary language. And the ordinary language might contain sometimes bits of philosophy, bits of law, bits of poetry, and so on and so forth. But you have to take it very, very, you know, uh, like a common uh, sensical language. Therefore, never look for any definition of any of the subjects of law in the Quran. For example, when it mentions the idea of nikah, marriage, it never gives you any definition about what is marriage. And so it just, you know, mention it and you have to go either to the books of, uh, I mean, to, to the lexicons or maybe to go back to history in order to see how the word has been used. So, uh, from that point of view, even I personally do not take Quran to be a book of law, although some law can be, uh, you know, uh, uh, taken from it. So, uh, I think I spent my five or ten minutes, and therefore I better terminate here and stop here and uh, wait for the comments and observations. Thank you very much. Friends, before we take your questions, and we do have time for um, maybe three or four questions, I'd just like to remind you um, now that we will have a reception afterwards. So if there's only three or four questions now, there will be lots of opportunity to speak afterwards. Thank you, Doctor. My, uh, in, in the Christian tradition, which is represented by, by say, ori origin, concerning the Bible, uh, there are inconsistencies in the in scripture, in the Christian scripture, 
and this was sown, sown in, into scripture by, by God. That's concerning the Bible. That humankind may struggle with them for perfection, which is contrary to the Muslim tradition. Yeah, the, the, uh, because uh, the Quran comes from, from God, therefore there, there cannot be inconsistencies. But then, uh, I'm surprised that uh, <coughs> the, the Quran almost talks about everything in life except philosophy and law. How is that? Okay. First of all, uh, the Quran does not speak about everything in life. I mean, it is, of course, a very selective book, and there are many things which have been left out. And otherwise, it would have been a very, very big book in, in, in a thousand volumes. Secondly, um, uh, it doesn't speak about uh, philosophy and law. It is not, uh, I mean, it, it, speak, it, it does contain philosophy and law, but I said it is not a book of philosophy and law. It is like, Gospel, as you mentioned, it is not, I and mean, gospel also is not a book or philosophy or law. It is not a book to be used by lawyers, jurists, or to, to be used by philosophers. The job, the function of religion is different. Actually, philosophy comes from the Greek. It was of a lot, the Middle Eastern, to have prophets rather than philosophers. And was the lot of Westerners to have philosophers rather than prophets. This has been a, a I don't know what to call it, something that God had meant it. Therefore, prophets are no philosophers, and this is nothing bad in them. They have been deliberately non-philosophers, because their main addressee, their main audience, were ordinary people, and they did not want to use a sophisticated language in order to discuss matters for them. That's why I mentioned that they mainly use analogy rather than um, logical demonstrations. So if in, uh, if in Europe and uh, in Greece in particular there's philosophers, not prophets, in the Middle East, prophets, not, not philosophers, in Iran, there's everything. Could you comment a little bit, where do the great schools of law in Sunni Islam come mm -hmm. from? What, what are they based on? They're not on the Quran, but these are the great schools of law, and they're always in conflict with each other, but they have an enormous in influence on social and political life. That's right. Well, uh, it has got a very, very long, long story. Um, in the Shiism, actually, the, the, you, you asked me about Sunni. I will come to that. But in the Shi'i case, I mean, the source of law are the imams of, of Shi'is. They were great jurists, you know, at least some of them if not all of them. And they, they discussed this legal matter with their students, and uh, you know, the records are there, and there are so many books written uh, based on the hadith and the tradition coming from them to us. And that's why I said that, uh, especially the Shi'i juries do not think that they need the Quran anymore for, for the legal matters. They have got you know, very rich sources of hadith and so on. Usually people went to them and asked them questions and therefore and they answered them and so they, they are the sources and the basis for, for legal issues. But in the case of the Sunni Islam, uh, first of all, there are traditions coming to us from the Prophet himself. Although there is a great difference over the number of the traditions. For example, Abu Hanifa, you know, one of the great teachers of one of the uh, uh, you know, four schools of, of law in the Sunni. Islam, he thought that only 17 hadith, 17 saints by Prophet were authentic. This, the rest, no. And then, because of that, you know, he based his, his uh, school of law on bias, on analogy. You know, he is very famous uh, for this uh, important innovation and introduction in the case. For example, in Shiism, they reject analogy. They think because of the scanty you know, nature of hadith in the Sunni Islam, they need analogy. Whereas in the Shi'i Islam, because they are, you know, uh, they have a lot of a wealth of traditions and hadith, they do not need any analogical reasoning and so on. 
The second thing, you know, was uh, the uh, introduction of the science of usul al-fiqh. Usul al-fiqh means the philosophy of law, of the logic of law. This was first introduced by the Sunni Islam, and then, of course, the Shiites, you know, followed them. This is a very important innovation in the case of Islamic tradition, because the logic of law is the logic of normative propositions, if you like. The logic of normative propositions, we have got a logic of non-normative, descriptive proposition, that is the Aristotelian logic, but the logic of normative propositions did not exist in, in the Greece, and they actually innovated it, they created it. When you have got two opposing, you know, normative things, two opposing orders or commands, which one gets priority over the others, and so on and so forth. And because of that, they enriched the law, they enriched, you know, and they actually compensated somehow for the, uh, for the uh, shortcomings of the hadith and so on. So that is the important thing. They borrowed many things from, from many sources, but mainly actually they used their brain and of course there were so many questions and problems coming to them because of the expanding nature of, of the time of the Islamic civilization. They had to answer them. And because of that, you know, the expanding nature of the fair. Yeah. <coughs> yes. Um, you said that in the Quran there is no idea of natural causality. But uh, do you think that in the realm of ethics, since the Quran uh, recognizes the um, role of practical reason in uh, knowing the good and the bad, do you think that at least in the ethical realm there is a notion of causality between reason, human reason, practical reason, and uh, human behavior, ethical conduct? Yes. Um, first of all, let me remind you that uh, there is no uh, the word good or bad, or hasan and qabi, cannot be found in the Quran. You for, you wouldn't find it. These are all innovations of later theologians. You know, again, there is no philosophy of ethics in the Quran. You know, it just tells you what to do and what not to do. There is no discussion over the husn and qob, the goodness or the badness, which is the object for uh, moral philosophers. Now, as to your question, that whether man is responsible for his actions, you know, and this is the kind of causality between the agent and the deed, here comes, you know, the dispute and uh, this agreement uh, that I mentioned. There are, for example, the Asharite, you know, who are the majority of the Muslims, about 90% of them. The Mutazilite school is virtually dead nowadays. Virtually, they think that there is no responsibility, there is no good and bad, there is no free will, you know, and they base their arguments on the Quran. They think that the God is himself is responsible for everything in the world. This is a very important thing. Let me tell you, Fakhrir of Akhruddin Razi, one of the great, you know, philosophers and theologians of the Sunni world, he was an Iranian, by the way, and we respect him very much. He wrote, you know, a philosophical commentary on the Quran, Mafatihul Ghaib, you know, in, in more than 20 volumes. And, uh, you know, there is, uh, there is a verse actually to, towards the end of the Surah Al-Baqarah, the second Surah. <coughs> there, you know, um, in, a, in a prayer mood, you know, the, the servants, the, 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 the slave of God, you know, prays and tells him, that uh, please forgive us for our sins. This is Rabbana Ferlano, Dunubana. That is what is there. Now, Fakhruddin Razi says that actually uh, a real philosopher does not say that because he knows that he is not responsible for sins. He is not responsible for, for what he does. But out of politeness, this is exactly the expression he uses, out of politeness, we say to God, okay, forgive us. This is, this is what, what was in the mind of the theologian, a great theologian. Out of politeness, we ask forgiveness. Because we know for sure that God is all, you know, I mean, omnipotent, omniscient. He knows everything. And whatever happens in the world is because of God. You see, there has been a mistake here. You know Hegel, of course, the, the, the German philosopher. He thinks that uh, Islamic theology or Islam is not a rational religion. 
because it doesn't believe in the principle of causality. That he says very explicitly. And I think the Pope Benedict, I mean, repeated virtually the same thing, you know, in his uh, speech, which became very controversial. It has got a root in Muslim, you know, theology, of course. I mean, there has been many Muslim theologians who maybe out of politeness did not speak their mind. But when they wrote for philosophers, they wrote for, you know, uh, co-theologians, you know, they did speak their mind. And they said actually that even according to the Quran, there is no causality and man is not responsible for his actions. It does contradict part of the Quran, but it is compatible with other parts of the Quran. Because Quran itself is an ambiguous on this thing. Sometimes it says that uh, You cannot will unless God wills before you. And sometimes, and in some other places, it is very ambiguous. It says that perhaps you are responsible for what you do, or perhaps you will be punished because of what you have done, you will be rewarded because of what you have done. There has been this ambiguity. I think it, it can be resolved. It can be resolved. It is no inconsistency. But in the history of theology, in the history of the commentary of Quran, it has not been so far resolved. There are, you know, the majority of Muslims who are on the side of no responsibility, and there are a minority who are on the side of the responsibility. And both systems, of course, has got their shortcomings. But in the Quran, as I said, uh, natural causality uh, very explicitly cannot be found. <coughs> Yes. So last yes. Uh, continuing on the same subject, I wonder then how do jurists tackle this issue of free will from the point of view of law, and how man is responsible or not for uh, They have to. I mean, they have to, but they do not discuss it because ju jurists they do not discuss philosophy, they do not discuss theology. Although I mean, theology and philosophy. I mean, inevitably have some uh, influence on, on, on law, but they do not discuss it actually. They take it for granted that man has got free will and we are free agents and therefore we are responsible for what we do. Therefore we can be punished either in this world or in the next life for what we do and for what we do not do for the obedience or disobedience of God and so on and so forth. So this is uh, a principle which is uh, a pre-assumption by all jurists. If you consider that people are not free agents, then law does not mean anything, and you cannot, you know, have uh, any, you cannot have judiciary, you cannot have justice, nothing like that. So when you uh, think of justice, you, you, I mean, uh, I mean, inevitably you have to think of free will and free agent and so on. There is a mention of justice in the Quran. There is a mention of Ihsan, which is above justice, which means generosity. Sometimes, you know, I mean, because Adl or justice means to claim your right. But sometimes you even do not claim your right. That is Ihsan. That is, uh, you know, uh, generosity. But there is no mention of free will at all in the Quran. There is no mention of free will. It is all about God, that is, He is the one who has got the real power, the real power. Others are just obedient or subservient to the will of God. Friends, I'd like to remind you of the reception that will be just outside of this room. And on behalf of Dr. Mehdi al uh, just to express uh, what an honor it is to me uh, personally to have such a distinguished speaker. Um, and I think person with a generous generous heart in addition to a brilliant mind. So please join me in thanking Dr. Sir.